sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. Life and salvation His empire shall bring. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of and we pray we will be ready the dawn of that day we'll join in singing with all the redeemed Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King come let us sing a song a song that we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Come, let us sing a song, a song that we belong to Jesus. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the Son, and 
you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. We're going to start reading at verse number 1. And we're going to go to the end of verse 21. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Here's a very familiar portion of Scripture. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Lord, we ask your blessing upon your word this morning. Bless it to our hearts that your Holy Spirit may impact it upon our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Someone once said that there are three types of people in the world. The first ones are undertakers. And I don't mean the profession. I I know there are undertakers in the world, but symbolically or figuratively speaking, there are undertakers. There there are those who do so very little with the living. And they bury everyone and everything around them. And then there are caretakers. 
And these are people who are continually watching out, but only for their own interests, for only for their own well-being, only for their own benefit. And so there are undertakers and there are caretakers, and then there are risk-takers. Risk-takers are those who are willing to lay everything out on the line for what is right. And in reading from the New Testament, in many different places, we meet these types of people. We read about the servant who took the one talent that he had been given. Remember the story of the talents? The master's going on a trip, gives ten talents to one, five talents to one, and one talent to the third. And we read about that servant who had been given the one talent, and instead of using it wisely, what did he do? He was an undertaker, and he went and he buried it in the ground. He was unwilling to do anything with what he had been entrusted with, and so that servant was an undertaker. Judas, who was one of Christ's closest friends, one of the disciples, he found himself looking after his own interests by pointing out Jesus Christ with a kiss. And because of his selfish ambition, because he was only looking out for himself, for his own benefit and for his own regard, we can call Judas a caretaker. We have undertakers, we have caretakers. And so there's no doubt as to which group Nicodemus the one who is involved in our story from the Scripture today, from the book of John, which group he belonged to, Nicodemus was a risk taker. You see, because it would have been highly risky for Nicodemus to come close to Jesus. Even under the cover of night in which verse number 2 suggests that he came to him late in the day. You see, because Nicodem Nicodemus was, he was a man, he was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jews. Jesus even referred to him in verse number 10, he referred to him as the teacher or one of the teachers of Israel. But he realizes, Nicodemus realizes that he must see Jesus. He realizes that he needs to come and talk to Jesus. He needs to come and get some questions answered that has been burning in his heart. And so Nicodemus risks his reputation. He risks his position. He dares to risk his standing in the community solely for the purpose of meeting with Jesus, of talking with Jesus. It would have been awful if someone had seen him. And we can learn a lot about Nicodemus, and we can learn a lot from him. In that, if we are called to be followers, true followers of Jesus Christ, then we also must be willing to take risks. We must be willing to step out onto ground or territory or areas that are both unsure and unchartered. We must be willing to separate ourselves from the status quo we must be willing to separate us ourselves from the statement that would always come to mind out of comfort by saying, that's the way I've always done it. And so that's the way I will continue to do it. We can learn a lot from Nicodemus. I was speaking with someone recently and this person told me that they felt God was stretching them. They felt that God was prompting them to do something for the kingdom that they weren't accustomed to doing. Something they had never done before. Something that they felt the Holy Spirit was leading them towards. And as they shared a little bit about it, I, I empathized with them because when you try something new, does it give you a little bit of butterflies sometimes? Does it make you a little bit nervous as to how other people might perceive you? Does it make you a little bit nervous because you might think, well, I've never done it before and I might fail at it? I believe that failure is the key to learning. 
And there's nothing wrong with failure as long as you're willing to get up again, make some adjustments and changes and say, okay, Lord, that was difficult. (laughs) I may not have looked the best doing it. I'm going to try it again. I remember when we were teaching the boys how to ride their bikes. Fantastic with the training wheels on. Remember training wheels? Where the kids would ride along and they'd be going like this. They'd be on their... And you're thinking to yourself, balance is not in their mind right now. (laughs) And suddenly you take the training wheels off and they fall over and they're wobbly and... And I don't know too many kids that if they fall off a bike, they throw the bike to the side and say, I'm never doing that again. They get up and they try it again. Because that failure helped them to understand that their balance wasn't quite right. So they need to make some minor adjustments in order to make it successful. Sometimes the church is known for anything but risk-taking. You know, we plan our course of action, we set our goals, whether they're financial or otherwise, and we sometimes base what we want to see happen in the future on the predictable of what happened in the past. Sometimes we base our decisions on what we did five years ago, or what we did last year, or what we did last month, or sometimes we even base what we do now just on what we did last week. And in doing so, we take very little risk and make very little change. Sometimes we think about how we always get out of church at the same time. And I've seen it just about everywhere I've ministered and whether I'm the pastor or whether I'm sitting in the, in the pew and I've done it myself, when the pastor tends to go just a little bit over time, what happens? Yeah, exactly. Because we're not accustomed to change. We're not accustomed to things being done differently. And, you know, it happens everywhere. It seems that once we discover the direction of our societal, cultural, or traditional wind, then we tend to follow that breeze, regardless of where the Holy Spirit is leading us. You understand what that means? Sometimes we can get so caught up in our own routine, in our our own comfort, in our own agenda, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us with that still small voice, and we kind of like swing at it like a fly is is bothering us. It's like, I'm I'm trying to concentrate here. The Holy Spirit wants to direct us, and He wants to show us something potentially different that will stretch us. There are times when we view our churches as institutions or clubs rather than mission outposts. We sometimes regard them as organized society rather than a soldier camp in the middle of a war. Because folks, we truly are in a war. The enemy is hard at work and he's battling against each one of us. And he's trying to take a hold of the soul that Jesus Christ so desperately desires. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, Jesus has not called us to be caretakers, to only look out for ourselves. And He certainly has not called us to be undertakers, where we bury everything around us. But rather, Jesus has called us to be risk-takers, to drop everything that we would consider valuable and important, then take up our cross and follow Him. Amen? Amen. Nicodemus did that. He put everything on the line for one meeting with Jesus. Everything he had worked so hard for, he put on the line. Everything that he had tried to achieve could have been lost by being spotted by someone with a loose tongue. And believe me, it would not have been the only time a loose tongue would have tried to destroy what God was trying to accomplish through something or someone. But that didn't matter to him. He just had to see Jesus. He just had to get close to Jesus. He just had to talk to Jesus. 
And so we need to ask ourselves, what will it take for us to be found like Nicodemus? What will it take for us to be found as risk takers for the sake of Christ and the kingdom? Well, you may ask, what are the risks that I would have to take upon myself in order to be considered a risk taker? What are the risks that we can avoid if we are to be true followers and not just distant admirers? Have you ever seen this event that goes on somewhere over in Spain, I believe it is? It's called the running of the bulls. And if you notice in the top left-hand picture, there are people who are only a few feet apart and some of them are taking the risk of being actually in with the bulls while other people are on the other side of the fence. Only a few feet apart. But some people are risk takers and some of them are just simply being observers. You know, I believe that can happen at times as well within our Christian world. That there can be those who are going full force and putting their lives and putting their reputations and putting their situations at risk for the sake of the kingdom while others are standing there or sitting there on the other side of the fence observing. So the first risk that we assume is that we will never fully comprehend, we will never fully understand where the Spirit is leading or what God is about in our lives and in our world. We can ask the greatest theologians and spend our entire lives studying, but we will never understand fully or comprehend the Spirit. Many have compared, and I spoke about this last Sunday, and so I'll say it again, or a couple of Sundays ago, that many have compared the leading of the Spirit to walking in the dark with a candle. It only gives you enough light It only gives you enough insight to see what your next step is. And how many of us would love to say to God, Lord, show me what's going to happen in my life for the next six months. Show me what's going to happen in my life for the next year, for the next two years. How many young people who when they graduate from high school would love to be able to say, okay, Lord, just put it on my laptop or or send it to my phone and just tell me what it is I'm supposed to do with my life. Wouldn't that be wonderful? The fact of the matter is, is that if someone is willing to tell you what's going to happen for the rest of their life, or your life, they probably would label themselves as a psychic. Because I don't believe the Holy Spirit desires to tell each of us what's going to happen for the rest of our lives. Because where would our trust level be? We need to be walking in the Spirit as if we're holding a candle in the darkness and we can only understand and know and be secure in the very next step. That step of faith that keeps us putting one step of faith, one foot in front of the other. We never can completely know what is around us or ahead of us. In fact, Paul expresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I believe that one day everything will be known as clearly as I'm standing before you here today. But for now, We need to be willing to take risks by following Christ by His Spirit one step at a time. Now Nicodemus, maybe because of his position, maybe because of his education, maybe just because of his character and personality, Nicodemus, he wants a completely rational and understandable belief. He wants all of his ducks in a row. He wants everything to make sense. But Jesus won't let him have that. Jesus says to Nicodemus in the Scripture that we've read, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
And this in the natural is completely incomprehensible for Nicodemus. In fact, his lack of understanding and even his frustration, we can sense it, it's evident in his response. Here's what he says. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? How can a man be born when he is old? And he even goes a step further. He says, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's almost asking that as a rhetorical question. He knows there's no truth in that. But it gives us an idea of where his mind is and sometimes where our minds are. Because how often do we look for rational answers to spiritual questions? How often do we look for the Holy Spirit to explain everything to us rather than putting our trust in Him and saying, I don't quite understand where this is leading, but I trust you. You see, when Jesus came to the disciples in the boat and invited Peter to come out of the boat and to walk on the water, when he first got out, he was looking at Jesus. He was taking it from a spiritual standpoint. And he began to walk on the water until he looked down and said, this is not rational. This should not be happening. And when we take a rational stand towards spiritual things, we start to sink. And only when we get our eyes focused back on Jesus and have a spiritual mindset will we begin to understand that it's through trust in the Holy Spirit that will get us places. Some of us, some who have been attending a Pentecostal church for years are just like Nicodemus. Some have never experienced that spiritual birth from above. And I examine my own life from that perspective to a certain extent because for myself, it was a rational, intellectual decision prompted by my parents. You go to church. You don't have the choice to stay home. As long as you're under our roof, you go to church. And so it was a rational, intellectual decision to attend and be obedient to my parents and to go. It wasn't until I took faith upon myself that my faith became more important to me. You see, too many people, young people especially, they only go to church because their parents take them. And for any young people who would be in their teen years, I would ask this question, if your parents didn't take you to church, would you still want to go? And that would be a very important question because if the answer is yes, then wonderful. But if the answer is no, then are you riding the, curt tail, the, the, the curtain tails of your parents' faith or are you developing your own? For some, we have become like Nicodemus. People can become religious, but they can become very separated and almost completely from God. And we, like Nicodemus, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through our lives. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us. For those who have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you would understand that it is a life-transforming experience. It's an experience that changes a person's perspective on faith and church and God and the kingdom. It changes a person from a churchgoer into a risk taker, into an active participant in the ministry of the Lord. And if we would follow Jesus, then there is one other risk that we would mention today that we must be willing to give up. And it's this complete control of our lives. We must be willing to give up complete control of our lives. Jesus said this to Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. And this is not interpreted to mean that we become aimless 
in our life, going here and there and everywhere. People going church to church, being uncommitted and, 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 and not dedicated. There are people that are called spirit chasers and they go to different places because they're looking to fill themselves and fill themselves all the time, but they're not looking to give anything to the kingdom. And so speaking as one who has been trying to follow the Spirit for many, many years, let me share with you this one word about how the Holy Spirit sometimes acts. Unpredictable. We can never predict what the Spirit will do. We can never predict how the Spirit will lead or when the Spirit will act in a given situation. As a minister, as a pastor, let me tell you one of the most scary things is when you spend a week or a couple of weeks or, or months and, and God is developing a message or a, sh- a sermon in, in, in the heart of a pastor and it's all prepared and it's all, you know, it's all on paper and you've got a PowerPoint, you've got everything and, and all of a sudden you get up on the platform and God says, uh-uh. And it's like, okay, God, this is what you laid on my heart. It's like, no. That's not what the people need to hear today. And that's happened a few times where I've stepped onto the platform and my notes have been set aside and the Holy Spirit has just spoken. doesn't happen every time. But unpredictability is one of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will lead us into some of the most difficult situations that we have ever faced. There are times when we go through circumstances and it's the Holy Spirit that is steering us in that direction to help to develop our faith, to help to strengthen our faith, to help to um, develop our witnessing ability so that we can help someone else along the way in their faith And wouldn't we just like it if every day was just a bed of roses? But that's not the Holy Spirit's agenda. Because the Holy Spirit desires to stretch us and move us. And as long as we have the Spirit working in us, we are not alone to face those difficult circumstances. We know that by following the Spirit's leading that He will not take us so far and then leave us on our own. There's a song that was sung a number of years ago. I'm not quite sure who sang it or who wrote it, but it went something like this. He didn't take us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build His home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. Who sang that? Keith Green? Was it Keith Green? I thought it might have been Brown Bannister. But it, good, good song. And, and when you go through situations in your life and you invite the Holy Spirit to be a part of that to strengthen you empower you and lead you he's not just going to say okay he's not going to bring you to this point and say okay see ya have a good time with that you're going to have a struggle but good luck with that he walks with us through it he is completely trustworthy he's completely trustworthy with the risk that we are taking in trusting in him And when we trust in Him, there will be no danger because He is completely and totally in control. When I get into the passenger seat of a a vehicle, sometimes if I'm really tired, I'll want to fall asleep or I'll want to nod off. And sometimes I will feel at ease enough to do that. But then other times I don't feel at ease at all when I'm driving with someone and I'll feel the need to stay awake and stay alert. It all depends who's driving. See, if I've never driven with someone before, I'll probably stay quite alert. 
to see what's going on around me, around the vehicle, especially for driving in traffic. Keep in mind, I grew up in Quebec, and that around Montreal is not the most amiable place to be driving. And I will tell you that there are precious few people that I feel at ease enough to fall asleep when they are at the wheel. But my dad is one of those people. You see, I can get into any vehicle that my dad was driving and I can be asleep in two minutes. Even if he was driving on those crazy highways around Montreal. And here are a couple of reasons why. Firstly, he's my dad. Cares for me. He knows that he would want to drive carefully with any member of his family in the vehicle. Secondly, is because he's been driving a vehicle since he's been about 16 years old, and in that time he's driven a car, he's driven a taxi, he's driven a delivery truck, he's driven a school bus, he's driven it in all kinds of weather, in all kinds of traffic, in all kinds of road conditions, and he's never had an accident or a driving infraction in his life. And so when I get into a vehicle that he's driving, if you look over at me in the passenger seat, I'll fall asleep very easily. On the other hand, if I'm driving with someone who seems slightly uneasy or unsure at the wheel, I will be inclined to stay awake and watch the road very carefully. I may even look over at the speedometer in fear that they may do something careless or foolish and so that I can warn them. And so, you see, when I do that, I'm basically telling them that I don't trust them. And I'm purposely not releasing total control or dependency over to that person. And there are still certain people that I drive with when I still try to remain very alert at the wheel in the passenger seat. Sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit that way. We feel that he is not trustworthy enough. We feel that he may do something foolish. We feel that he may steer us in the wrong direction. We feel that he may lead us into something that's uncomfortable or dangerous. Many Pentecostals today, Even though we refer to ourselves as a Pentecostal church, we need to understand these statistics. That even though 100% of our credential holders are baptized in the Holy Spirit, only 20-30% to of congregations in Pentecostal churches, people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is significantly different than 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. And I don't pretend to know everything about the Holy Spirit and how He works nor do I hope to understand everything because many of it is a mystery. Much of it is a mystery. But I believe if we truly want the Holy Spirit to lead, we need to get into the passenger seat and say, okay, Spirit, you take the wheel. And then sit back and trust. Too often we want to, when we say, okay, Holy Spirit, you drive. Too often when we see Him steering into a certain direction, we'll take the wheel and we'll, no, I want to go back this way. Or if we see the Holy Spirit going in a certain direction, we may, no, I've never done this and I hope you wouldn't either reach your foot over and put your foot on the brake. Sorry, Spirit. Going a little too fast for me. But if we truly, like Nicodemus, want to give everything over to God and allow the Holy Spirit to direct our lives, we need to just say, Jesus, take the wheel. And go and lead and drive wherever it is you want to take me and I will trust and I will follow. We need to give the Holy Spirit complete control. We need to be saying, Holy Spirit, 
you drive. Holy Spirit, I trust you. I trust you to be careful with my life. I trust you to be careful with my children. I trust you to be careful with what you have blessed me with. And I'll share with you a story in January when Greg, is it in January? Sorry, in May. Greg came home after internship. He told us that he was going to be moving to Halifax. We found out why after. But not only because Brittany was there, but because he felt a definite pull and calling that God was going to work through him there. And so he came back after internship. He did a couple of weeks at school and came back here to Renfrew and was with us for just a few weeks before he drove to Halifax. And on that Sunday, that last Sunday morning when he was here, and he, if you remember, he helped with, with communion that Sunday, and then we drove to Montreal that afternoon. Stayed overnight in Montreal as he was a little unsure of the highways and how to get out to the 20 going towards New Brunswick. And so I said, well, I'll go out with you and you take your car and I'll take mine. We'll stay over at Nanny and Grandpa's and then I'll, first thing Monday morning, we'll go out to the, take the 116 to the 30 to the 20 and then you go. And as we changed from the 30 to the 20, and I looked in my rearview mirror and I saw Greg put his blinker on and he passed by me on the left-hand side. You talk about driving and not having control. I was wiping the tears from my eyes and, and thinking, oh God, how is he going to handle everything on his own? And at that point, God told me and said, don't worry, I've got the wheel. It was brought back to mind again just yesterday. We, uh, John and I actually we played golf last week over at Dragonfly. And as we were putting our clubs away, John, remember a little, this little chipmunk came out? This little chipmunk came out. And its eyes weren't even open yet. And it was, it was staggering all over the parking lot. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's cars coming and going. It's not going to be long before this is flat in the, in the parking lot. And so I went over to it and I picked it up. And its eyes were still closed. And I brought it back over to the wooded area beside the parking lot. And I went to put it down. And as I put it down, it stepped out in the grass and it jumped back in my hand. And so I thought, uh-oh. So I took it home. went back to my car and I put it in the cup holder and I closed the, the lid down so it wouldn't get out. And John had a granola bar in his golf bag. <laughs> gave me the granola bar and I broke off pieces of it. As soon as I gave it the granola bar, it, it started devouring it. It was starving. It was just skin and bones. So we got it home and we called the vet and the vet told us, well, you can give it some milk. Don't give it homogenized because it'll give it worms. Just... 1% and dilute it with a lot of water, some granola bar, some apple. And so we did that for about a week and a half until its eyes opened yesterday. And as soon as its eyes opened, it started scratching at the side of the box that it was in. And Taylor and Brandon and I, we were kind of watching it every day, making sure it had food and dumping out. It was eating a lot, and so we were cleaning the box that we were keeping it in. And so yesterday it came time to let it go. I took it out of the box and I held it in my hand and it's still so small. Put it down in, in the backyard and it, it kind of looked up at us. <laughs> looked around at the grass. And then it came over to my leg and started to try to crawl up my leg. <laughs> and I said, that's it, I'm mom to this thing. So we took it to another area and we let it go. We let it run around the yard for a little bit. And then we brought it over closer to the deck and I put some more apple and some more milk and I kept the box that it was in and the cloth that it was in and in case it wanted to some place to come back that was familiar. But as soon as I let it go, it ran over into the next yard and I could see it creeping through the grass. 
And then all of a sudden I heard, And our cat, Whiskus, came up behind on the deck. I said, oh, oh, this is a bad situation. Took the cat, put it inside, and went back over to the fence. And I watched as it started to make its way and started to hop. I said, what about, is it going to know how to find food? And almost as I was saying that, it started to dig in the neighbor's garden just a little bit, pulled up a seed, and it's sitting there thinking, wow. See, at that moment, God said, this is one of my creatures. Thanks for taking care of it for a while. But I've got it from here. And even though everything in me wanted to go over and get it, put it back in the box so it would be safe, God said, don't worry. See, in our lives, we need to trust that the Holy Spirit knows what He's doing. We need to trust that the Holy Spirit has an agenda and has a direction, and has a plan for each one of our lives. And there are times when we, our our parenting and our humanity gets in the way and we want to try to take control again and say, this is how I feel safe, but the Holy Spirit has some other plans. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and join me on the platform again as we prepare to come around the Lord's table. In the turmoil of life, no matter what situation arises, we need to be able to say, we need to be able to develop the attitude because attitude is keep calm and let Jesus take the wheel. Because almost 2,000 years ago, A man walked on this earth who was more than just a man. And he said through his words and through his actions, he said that if we are willing to risk our lives on the belief that he is the Messiah, then the Holy Spirit will come and it will blow through our lives and make us radically different. He said that our lives, though they were dead and lifeless because of sin and evil, that through accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and by inviting the Spirit to come and live within us and by by being baptized in the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can become risk takers and radically different for the kingdom. But here's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we willing to take the risk that Jesus was right? When Jesus Christ came to this earth, the plan of God the Father was that He come to teach and to heal and to minister and to direct. And all of that seems humanly possible. But the greatest thing He did when He came to earth is that He died on the cross. And because Jesus Christ was fully human and fully divine, the human side of Him could have said, oh, I don't think I'm going to like this. The human side of him could have taken over and said, these people can just fend for themselves. Most of them don't even care that you sent me to be their Savior. The human side of him could have said, oh, this is going to be so painful. And I don't know about you, but I don't like pain. I wouldn't mind pain so much if it didn't hurt. But the human side of him could have thought about the nails going in his hands and the nails going in his feet and the thorns going into his brow and the whips across his back 
and that's just the physical side. Then there's the spitting and the mocking which attacked his heart. And the human side of him said, I don't, could have said, I, I don't want to hurt physically. I don't want to hurt emotionally. And so I'm going to take control of this wheel and steer away from the cross. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the things he prayed was this, if it be possible that this cup could pass from me. And I've said this before, that was his human side talking. If there's any other way, Lord, how many times have we gone through a situation and it's hard and it's difficult and it's stressful and it's hurtful and we said, Lord, is there any other way for this to happen? But I'm so glad that when Jesus finished that prayer, He didn't just say, if there's any other way, if there's a way for this cup to pass from Me, He didn't stop there. He didn't end the prayer there. But He said, nonetheless, Your will be done. Everything within Him, the human side, was wanting to grab that wheel again and take control and steer away from the cross. But He knew what the plan was. And so he said, nevertheless, your will be done and allowed his life to be taken to the cross to die for our sins.